Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds toward the children of man. Let's pray. Father, we come before you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, the one whom you sent to fulfill every word you promised. We praise you for the awesome deeds you have done throughout redemptive history. You created this world and all that it contains with a word. You revealed yourself to your creation. You revealed your character, your promises. You tell us what's true, what's right, what's honorable and good. You tell us what's false, wrong, dishonorable, and evil. And then you even tell us what will happen if we trust you or if we don't. You tell us of life, you tell us of death, happiness, misery, eternal fellowship with joy through trusting what Christ has accomplished, or eternal separation and judgment for naught. Lord Jesus, thank you for choosing to come down and save your creation through your life, death, and resurrection. You lived a perfect life in complete harmony with the Father's will, not straying once, confirming that you are a perfect, holy sacrifice, and you died to be that sacrifice, to pay for the penalty of sin and rebellion for all those who believe in you. They believe and they are forgiven. They are released from their eternal death sentence and your resurrection demonstrates your victory over sin and death and affirms all that you said and did. Holy Spirit, help us believe in the necessity of these things and persuade us to purposely point others to what you've done and what you're doing and what you will do when Christ returns. And it's in his name we request these things. Amen. Raise your joys and triumphs high. Let's stand together with a chorus of joyful voices declare that we worship a risen Savior. Christ the Lord is risen today. Sacrifice. 
reading this morning comes from John chapter 4. We're picking up where we left off last week in verse 27. Jesus has just had a conversation with the woman at the well. He has declared himself to be the Messiah that was prophesied in the Old Testament. This morning we're going to read verses 27 through 42. Follow along as we read what happens next. At this point his disciples came And they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, What do you seek, or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, No one brought him anything to eat, did he? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, and to accomplish his work. Do you not say, There are yet four months, and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, that they are white for harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages, and is gathering fruit for life eternal, so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case the saying is true, One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all the things that I have done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word, and they were saying to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all that you have accomplished through Christ, and especially today as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. We thank you for all of the work that he came to do and for the harvest that he prepared Lord, help us to be faithful laborers, to go into the world, to proclaim the good news of the risen Son of God, so that people might hear and believe and repent of their sins. We confess that we are often short-sighted and easily distracted from the mission that you have called us to. So we pray that you would transform our hearts and that you would fill us with love and compassion for sinners, the same love and compassion that Christ himself showed towards sinners. Father, we pray for an abundant harvest, even in this congregation this morning, that those who are here, those who are watching online, would respond to the preaching of your word. We pray that sinners would repent, that believers would be encouraged, and that Christ would be magnified above all. We pray that you would bless Paul as he preaches, so that the preaching of your word would be powerful and effective this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Church family and friends, we're not here this morning simply to declare the fact that he is risen. We are here to speak, to read, to sing, and to preach of why that matters. Let's stand together as we celebrate the fact that because we have a risen Savior, we can stand in him. And because we have a risen Savior, he is also a coming Savior. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. 
This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm to the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand.
light shined among us, His glory revealed. Living, He loved me, dying, He saved me, buried, He carried my sins far away. Rising, He justified, freely forever. One day He's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. One day they led Him up Calvary's mountain. We pray now as, as your word is open, as we continue to worship together, that the joy in our hearts would be used to draw others to you who do not know you today, Lord. We pray for many across this country and this world to hear a clear gospel priest that you would draw them to you and add to your church this very day. We pray going forth that a reminder, a, a specific dedicated reminder today for those who are in your church. To, to spur us on to greater righteousness, to seek holiness out of gratitude for what you have done. 
Help us now to hear your word preached clearly in Christ's name. Amen. Be seated. Well, let's take our Bibles. <clears throat> let's take our Bibles this morning. We are in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're taking a break today uh, from our normal study. We've been in Romans every week. We're here every week. We'd love to have you back if you're visiting with us uh, or if you're just in town. We're going through Romans together. But this morning, I want to draw our attention uh, to a, a very important passage. It's the longest chapter in 1 Corinthians, but it's also the, the longest discussion, uh, the most um, precise discussion of the resurrection in the scriptures. And I remember, as I think back over the last year, and I, I think back to last Easter, last resurrection day, I was preaching to an empty room. And um, at that time, we were saying things, and we continue to say things like, until things return to normal, or when things return to normal. Uh, well, there's something in us that is, um, that's, that's tentative, something that longs for change. It's in all of us. It, it comes out in a lot of ways. It was being stated long before this last year. We, we continue to say, and have always said things like this, when I get a promotion, when I get married, when I retire, when I get my driver's license, or when I get a bicycle, when I get a new job, my personal one is when I grow up, when things get back to normal. We have that sense of tentativeness that is always there. It's, it says we're, we're, we're never just okay with where things are right now and what the Lord is doing right now. It's, it's something else over the next hill. We say that in a lot of different ways. The grass is greener on the other side or there's something better over there. We say things like this because we, we defer change until later when things return to normal. Uh, if you think about it this way, and I've been thinking about this, especially this week and this last year, that the church, the body of Christ, not just here, but everywhere, it exists right now in the age of the abnormal. Where are we? If you go to the amusement park called the earth uh, and you find yourself there, we are here. We are in the abnormal. We, we are not in the normal. It is the age before the not yet. It is a time in which fallen humanity and sin are on display, and it's been like that since the garden. Fallen humanity is not normal. Sin is not normal. It is a departure. It is a disruption. Uh, we live in a parenthesis between the garden at the beginning and the garden that is to come. And we are sinners inhabiting a sinful, fallen world in this time that is marked chiefly by sin and fallenness. And yet, in the meantime, Jesus is at work. God is at work building a people for his namesake. He is calling out a people. The brokenness is being healed. The sin is being wiped away. The church is being washed and renewed. The creation is groaning, but it too will be restored to perfection. Citizens of a coming kingdom are being called out, marked out, rescued from their feudal way of life. And God is forming a people for himself right now in this abnorm abnormality called the church. And until things return to normal, the church, made up of these kingdom, new kingdom citizens, are to be like a kingdom of priests calling out to a lost and hurting world to believe in Jesus, the soon coming king. This is the story of Scripture. It begins with a garden lost, it ends with a garden restored. It begins with a people lost, it ends with a people saved and secure. It begins with a people scattered to the ends of the earth. It, be, it ends with a people gathered before the throne of Christ. It begins with the serpent tempting. It ends with the serpent crushed. It begins with a son promised to a woman, and it ends with the son reigning as king. This is the story of Scripture. The story of the Corinthian church is, in a sense, our story Two, if you're familiar at all with 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, it's, it's a mess. The church is a mess. 
not Paul's letter, but the church that he's addressing. It's a mess. It's full of sin. It's, it's full of all sorts of struggles. All the sins that are common to man are on display there, and they're on display in some pretty apparent ways. And apparently some of the Corinthians were denying the physical resurrection of the body. There's reasons for this, possibly. They were, uh, because of where Corinth was, it was kind of at a crossroads. And uh, a lot of them had Greek pagan backgrounds. And, and like most Christians, they bring their baggage with them into the church. And so they had all kinds of weird ideas, proto-Gnosticism and, and all these kind of ideas about the body and anything that's physical and not spiritual. And, and, and they were just, uh, all, just full of all sorts of confusion. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is addressing them in the midst of this confusion, and he's addressing the future reality of our resurrection, which is grounded in the past reality of Jesus' resurrection. We do not believe in the resurrection, our future resurrection, because of sentimental reasons because of grandparents or parents or loved ones or friends that we hope to see. We believe in that, Paul says, because Jesus is resurrected from the grave. And the reason why he covers this, if you look at the passage for 58 verses, is to teach us that we do not have to defer change until later. We do not have to say until things return to normal. In fact, he is using the teaching of our future resurrection rooted in the past resurrection of Christ to spur the church on to faithfulness now. Until things return to normal, what should we do? How are we to live? How is the future present already? How has eternity already dawned in the, the hearts and lives of God's people in this fallen world? Well, that's the question I want us to, to look at this morning. And, and what I want to do before we look at just one verse, we're going to look at verse 58. It's all aimed at that, verse 58, and we're going to see that together. But I want to just give you a brief flyover of this really long chapter. We're not going to go through every verse, but just kind of a section-by-section section understanding of what Paul is doing and how he unfolds his, his logic and his argument here. The first thing he does in verses 1 through 11 is he tells them that the resurrection is essential. Uh, in verses 1 through 11, it provides, he provides eyewitness evidence that Christ is truly risen. Cephas, Peter saw him, Paul saw him, James, the brother of Jesus, 500 people at one time saw the resurrected Christ. But what all of that is rooted in is the work of Christ. And he de details this, look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> now I make known to you, brethren... The gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and which also you stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast the, faith, the, the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. In our day, the gospel has become a lot of things. It's become gospel hyphenated insert pet cause. It's been gospel plus other things, but whatever we believe about the gospel and its fruits, whatever we think about the outworking and the ramifications of the gospel, the synchronon, the, the irreducible aspect and foundation of the gospel is what Paul says here in verse three, Christ died for our sins. A gospel that doesn't include that is not the gospel. A gospel that demeans that, that covers over that is not the gospel. A gospel that says that the gospel is just for us to love one another is not the gospel. A lot of the things that are called the gospel in scripture are actually fruits of the gospel. A lot of the things that people call today the gospel in scripture are called the fruits of the gospel. But the centermost piece of the gospel is that Christ, the Messiah, the expected Savior of the world, put on flesh, he dwelt among us, and he died for our sins according to the scriptures. This is the promise of the Old Testament fulfilled in the New. Christ died in the place of sinners. He took their sins upon him at his death. 
This is the unmistakable testimony of Scripture. You can't go far or anywhere, really, any section of Scripture and not see this, either in prospect in the Old Testament, where it's anticipated, where it's prophesied, where it's hoped for and longed for, or in the New Testament, where it's fulfilled in Christ. Just a sampling of this. 1 John 3, 5, He appeared in order to take away sins, and in Him there is no sin. That's really key to the gospel. That the only way a man could take the place of men is for that man to be perfect and be sinless. Jesus was and is. Galatians 1.4, he gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. To be sin on our behalf. That is substitution. That is one taking the place of another. It's to be counted as a sinner. Jesus was not a sinner. But to be made sin on our behalf means that he is treated as only sinners should be treated. And we receive what only he is rightful to receive, the righteousness of Christ. Galatians 3, 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. How? Having become a curse for us in our place. Romans 5, 6, for while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Do you feel far away from God this morning? Maybe you're not even a Christian and you you feel your need of him, but you're not even sure, could, could he possibly save someone like me, knowing what I've done, knowing who I am, knowing what goes on in my heart and in my mind? Paul says in Romans 5, 6, Christ died for the ungodly. And that's true of everyone. That's true of everyone apart from Christ. In Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is what Paul is saying here in verse 3. Christ died for sinners according to the scriptures. Verse 4, and he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now, Paul says in, these, in the opening verses here that this is the gospel that he received. It's the gospel of first importance. Verse 1 is the gospel that Paul preaches. And, and there's, a, there's a point of confusion here. And I hear this, and I've heard this many times. A point of confusion enters in here with the first four verses. You may have already been thinking about this. There's some things that are missing here that we often assume with the gospel. And I think rightly assume with the gospel. So for example, there's no detail here about faith and repentance. For someone to believe the gospel, they must have faith and they must turn from their sins. There's nothing said here explicitly about justification by grace alone, through faith alone. So we have to ask the question here, how can this be the gospel? Well, this is an important nuance and it's easy to miss. But, but verses 1 through 5, especially verses 3 through 5, is not a gospel description showing how the gospel works. It's a gospel sh- summary showing why the gospel works. You understand the difference? Uh, how the gospel works means that uh, all who hear this word must repent. They must believe by faith, and that is a gift of God. But Paul here in this ver in these few verses is showing how the gospel not how the gospel works but why the gospel works. It works because Christ has done all the work. It works because Christ has fulfilled what is demanded of us by the law, demanded of us by God, demanded of us by God's pure, unadulterated, perfect holiness. Notice that all of this he says in verses 3 and 4 is according to the scriptures. What this means is that the promise and the plan of God to send his son to die and be resurrected was laid down beforehand in the promises of the Old Testament. Many texts on this, there are many places we could go, some of the more obvious ones about the the death and burial of the Messiah we have in places like Isaiah 53, where Paul says here, Christ died according to the scriptures. Isaiah 53 testifies to this. The Messiah will bear the sin of many. He will be pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. He will be assigned a tomb with the ungodly. He will be raised, Paul says, according to the scriptures, verse four. Psalm 16 says that the Lord's Messiah, his anointed will not undergo decay, but he will be raised and exalted as the Messiah. 
the, the suffering one of Psalm 22 who cries out to the Father on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He cries out to the Father in anguish, but he's also at the end of Psalm 22 crying out and raising the cup of victory before the Lord. How can he do that? Because he is the resurrected Messiah. Isaiah 53 as well says that the suffering servant will see his spiritual offspring and his days will be without end. He will die and he will be resurrected. And Paul says all of this is according to the scriptures. The second section is verses 12 through 19. And Paul shows here that the resurrection is not a farce. It's not a farce. This next stage of Paul's argument connects the, the indivisibility of Jesus' resurrection and the resurrection of believers. Look down, for example, at verse 16. Paul says there, If the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and you're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep, those who have died in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. What do you think about that? You, you might have heard in, in a basic philosophy class of Pascal's wager, which goes something, the, the poor man's explanation is something like this, that even if none of this is true, well, at least we lived a moral life. <clears throat> at least we lived a, a good life. Paul says, I'll have none of that. Look what he says. He says, if none of this is true, then don't take joy in having a moral majority or a moral life or a cleaned up outer shell. He says, if none of this is true, if Christ is not raised from the grave, then we are to be pitied, not celebrated. I realize this puts us all in a bind, doesn't it? If you come to Jesus just to reform your outer shell, then Paul says you're to be pitied. If you come to Jesus just for some outward reformation and not a complete revitalization of your soul, then you are at the wrong place. Jesus came to change men and women and to change them from the inside out. And the down payment of our ultimate change is what he did in his own body. His body was resurrected from the grave. Death could not hold him. The resurrection is not a farce. Uh, another section, verses 20 through 28, Paul shows that our resurrection is still future. So our future resurrection, the down payment of that, is seen in the promise and what has happened in the past resurrection of Christ. The resurrection is, has set in motion. He says all of this in verses 20 through 28, a very detailed, important section. But he says there, the resurrection of Christ has set in motion a process that will conclude with the arrival of the end, the resurrection of believers, and the coming kingdom of Jesus in all its fullness. Everyone who is in Christ will be resurrected at the return of Christ. He will reign over his earthly kingdom, and then he will abolish death and he will hand over the kingdom to his father, ushering in an eternity without end. Our resurrection is future. And then we see the next section. It kind of goes along with what we saw in 12 through 19. In 29 through 34, he says that the resurrection is absurd if it's not true. Kind of building off that earlier case, he, he takes up a couple of, of nuanced and, but important arguments here. In fact, he, he does this with probably what is considered one of the most difficult verses in all of the New Testament. But the argument goes something like this. If there's no resurrection, then why have sinners all throughout history identified with the death and resurrection of Jesus and baptism? It's meaningless, Paul says, if that's true. Why has, Paul goes on with another argument, why has the apostle himself subjugated himself to constant danger, ridicule, and problems if Jesus is not resurrected from the grave? Look at verse 32. He says, if, if I'm doing what I do, the preaching of the gospel, if I'm doing all this from human motives, by the way, I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, and the wild beast there he might have in mind people. <laughs> I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus. What, what does it profit me if Christ is not resurrected? If the dead are not ri raised, listen to this. He quotes from Ecclesiastes here at the end of verse 32. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. You know what he's doing? He is assuming 
the logical end of the atheist argument, or at least it should be the atheist argument. Most atheists that you know, and agnostics as well, they, they are not consistent in their worldview. They do things and they say like, there is no God and yet they love their wives. Uh, and they haven't been forced to explain that uh, that love that they have for their children or for their wife is just a, a chemical response or just a gene. Paul says here something very important. He says, if Christ is not raised, then life doesn't matter. If, if Jesus is not raised from the grave, you have no justification for love, for beauty, for intelligence, for thought, for art, for creation, for doing anything, for motivation, for work, for all those things that are out in front of us. In fact, he just assumes the argument, if Christ is not raised from the grave, then just let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. It's a bold argument, but it's an important one. And again, he's leaving us with no wiggle room here. Uh, th this is not a, a place where we can just say, I really like the teachings of Jesus, but I don't believe in that miracle stuff, or I don't believe in the, uh, the supernatural aspects of his life and ministry or anything that he's doing through his people. I like him for his moral teaching. Paul says, we'll have none of that. If Christ is not raised from the grave, then all we have left to do is just live it up. It's, he says, he assumes the argument of the atheistic hedonist at the end of verse 32. There's no wiggle room here. Either he is, and it changes everything, or he's not, and we're just stuck. It is what it is, and there's no justification for anything. All people need to sit with that thought for at least a portion in their life and think that through very carefully. Because the only answer to that very dark thought is Christ. There's no hope outside of him. That's what Paul is saying here. Then he shows in verses 35 through 57, the, the final major section, the resurrection is demonstrated and illustrated there. He, he illustrates it this way. If you look down at verse 54, but when this perishable, that's this body, that's this shell, it's perishable. Uh, all of our bodies, you can't see it right now. It's invisible to us, but they all have an expiration date. Uh, they, they have a sell-by date, they, they will perish, they will die, they will wear out. When this perishable will have put on the imperishable, that which will not wear out, that which is fit for eternity. This mortal will have put on immortality. This, this body of death will put on a body that will not die. Then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We come to verse 58, the very end here. So what about now? You'll need to take some time and, and read and study this chapter for yourself and read through and follow Paul's logic, but this is where it's all pointing. And I just want to bring this to you here for just a couple of minutes in verse 58. What Paul says here is a consequence of all that he has said and sustained for 57 verses. Until things return to normal. Again, what's normal? Christ is present, sin is vanquished, and we are in a new heavens and a new earth with him forever. That's normal. Until things return to normal, what should we do? How should I be living? How, what, what should I be thinking about? Do you believe that Jesus died and rose again? Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus, a real man, as the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son of God, put on flesh, he did not detract from his deity one iota. He added humanity to his eternal deity and he put on flesh and he walked this earth as a real man, tempted at all points as we are, yet without sin. Do you believe in him? And that this man lived a life of perfection, challenged, tempted, and yet never once sinned. He had brothers and sisters real brothers and sisters of flesh and blood that watched him grow up. He had an older, two older brothers that 
would come to know him later and even give testimony to him, James and Jude, in the New Testament. He had a mother that was there with him all the way to the cross and giving testimony. And he had disciples that were around him giving testimony. And not just testimony even at the point of death, but even after that, even after they had come to their senses and it dawned on them what they had just lived through. They gave the next decades of their life to him and they died for the cause. Why would anybody do that? Do you believe in this Jesus? Do you believe that this Jesus died a real death on a cross later on a Friday afternoon? He was put in a tomb and he was there and his body was really dead in that tomb. And then on early Sunday morning, he was raised from the grave and his body had life and his lungs were filled with air. And now he has a, a, a body that is glorified, a body that is a real body, not a Gnostic body, not a figment of someone's imagination, not some kind of ghost, but a real body of flesh and blood. Here, put your, put your hands in the holes of my hands. He said. This is the Jesus that we believe. This Jesus is so wonderful, so powerful, so glorious. This is the Jesus that we believe. So what about now? If you believe in this Jesus, listen to what Paul says, verse 58. Look at it. He says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. That is the most loaded, weighty therefore in all of the New Testament, isn't it? 57 verses of sustained gospel argumentation, uh, very nuanced in his argument all throughout this chapter. And then he says, and he looks to the church and each person in the church at Corinth and at Grace Community, and he says, therefore, my beloved brethren. This whole chapter is, deals with one specific issue, the implications of the resurrection for the church right now. Christ's resurrection is past. It is historically finished. Our resurrection is historically future. And what difference it makes is what Paul is talking about here in verse 58. Since our sins are forgiven through Christ, since death has been conquered, since believers have an indestructible hope of a future resurrection, therefore, listen to what Paul says. Notice who he addresses here. My beloved brethren. Don't worry, it's the sister in her in there too. But this is just a common way of saying the church, right? He's talking to believers. This is very important to understand. What Paul says here, you must be a follower of Christ to understand what he's about to say in verse 58. Because if you're not, this is going to sound like works righteousness. And in fact, verse 58 is not a salvation verse. It's a, sanctif uh, it's a sanctification verse. It's a Christian life verse. It is not a verse about how to come to Christ. If you read it that way, then Christ died needlessly on the cross because we could just work our way to him. But that's not what he says. You must love what Christ loves. You must love what he gave his life for, the church. There is a deep, abiding, persevering, communal, committed love, which is a supernatural work of the Spirit that will be evident in the lives of God's people. Not perfect, but it will be evident. Believers are to love one another, and they are committed to love what they quite possibly once loathed. Yet Paul could not have addressed these words to a more disjointed, disunified body of believers. This church at Corinth had it all, didn't it? If you know anything about this, this church, it was just full of sin and problems and issues and divisions. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 starts off on that note. There, there's divisions among you. They're, they're dividing up over who their favorite leaders are and all those kind of silly things. And it just gets worse. They're dragging each other into court. And there's relations going on between family members in the church. And, and somebody might say in 1 Corinthians 5, well, that's not my business and Paul says, actually, the church is arrogant because they don't, they don't love one another enough to deal with those things. You just have all kinds of problems in this church. Then they even take something that is good, a way that God has given us to edify and build up the church, and they get divided over that. 
Three whole chapters just on the gifts. What unifies us, what brings us together, Paul says in the opening verses, is the gospel. And so until things return to normal, the church needs to be reminded of a few things. And they're all here in verse 58. Let me point these out for us. What do we need? What needs to mark us, characterize us as a church? Number one, it's persistent gospel faithfulness. Persistent gospel faithfulness. Paul says there in verse 58, be steadfast. The verb to be there, it's actually not just with steadfast. He uses it here as a command and it governs the entire verse. Everything that he says here is, is, is present, it's active, it's ongoing, and it's a command. This idea of steadfastness, it speaks to conviction or firmness of direction. You know who you are, you know where you're going. It's convictional faithfulness in this context. Convictional faithfulness rooted in the gospel. Remember that? First five verses. It's all there. Our life, our rootedness, our conviction is not in our stubbornness. It's not in my opinions. It's not in my preferences. But it is a persistent gospel faithfulness. The word literally, steadfast, literally refers to being seated it's to be settled, firmly situated. It's like if you're putting down posts to build a fence. It is to put that post in the ground, but we can't just kind of dig a shallow hole of two inches and just kind of sit there. It's going to fall over. But it is to put it firmly in the ground, to cement it in, to make sure that it's not going to move. That's the word that he uses here, steadfast. It's there and it's there to stay. Back in verse 1, Paul says, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and which also you stand. You're steadfast in this. You're rooted in this. He says uh, later on in chapter 16, verse 13, one of the last commands that he gives to the church, he says, be on the alert, stand firm in the faith. What is persistent gospel faithfulness? It is standing firm in the faith once delivered. It is the standing firm in the teaching of Scripture, the standing firm in the faith that we have in Christ and the gospel. Secondly, it is practicing gospel fortitude. Now, this might sound similar to what we just saw, but Paul uses a different word here. He says, be immovable. The idea here is that there is a tendency in all of us to shift and to sway from at different times in our life and different seasons from biblical convictions. Some of you are swaying right now. No one else knows it. Only you know it. You're swaying. You're shifting away from what Scripture teaches, what is rooted in the gospel, what is identified by Christ as truth. Now more than ever, the church needs gospel resilience. There's a tendency, a temptation for all believers to sway and shift in gospel convictions. It carries the same basic idea as that first word, steadfast, but, but here it's now more intensity, with more intensity. Your, your faith is not easily shaken. You don't fall prey to clever ideas and philosophies or empty promises. You're not caught up in all the noise. Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you been paying attention the last year? Have your ears been opened? Have your eyes been opened to see all the, and hear all the noise and the, the fog that has descended upon the church? Paul says, be immovable in the gospel. Not your preferences, not your political convictions. How easily those things change. How easily those things come and go. And be careful, too, about assuming that those former things are gospel convictions. Be careful that you not make something the gospel that is not. How does this happen? How 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 are we to become immovable here? How do I get this? Well, Paul actually answered that question back in verse 2, if you look at it. He pictured this earlier in verse 2. By which you are saved, this gospel, by which you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Paul, Paul imagines a scenario in which there are people who profess faith in Christ, but their faith is not real because they depart from the faith. And so they may have an outward faith, but it's not a real faith of the heart. It's not a real faith of belief and trust in Christ. 
Those who believe in the Lord, believers must hold firmly to the good news they have received. This is immovable perseverance he describes there back in verse two. How, do we, how are we to become immovable? Hold fast to the word. Hold fast to the word. You're not gonna do that, by the way, by just dropping in five minutes a day, once a week, checking in. You need the mind of Christ. You need the word of God washing over your thoughts and ideas, your preferences, your opinions, your plans, your dreams, your hopes. You need the word of God informing, infusing every aspect. This is God speaking to us. It is God's word breathed out, Paul says to Timothy. Paul says, hold fast to this word. If believers, he says there back in verse two, do not remain in the faith, then Paul says their initial faith was in vain. It wasn't genuine, it wasn't real. It was like, a, it was like the seed in Jesus' parable that had fallen on rocky soil. They believe for a while, but when a time of testing, when difficulties come, Jesus says they fall away. They do not lose their salvation, but their salvation is proven and seen to be false at the very beginning. The same idea comes from Paul in Colossians 1.23. He says, if indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. Church, listen, everything, everything outside of Christ is vying for your attention and for your hope to be moved, to be swayed, to be put in something else. Finally, here at the end of verse 58, it's pursuing gospel faithfulness or fruitfulness. Faithfulness is good too, but here it's pursuing gospel fruitful, fruit, fruitfulness. He says, always abounding in the work of the Lord. The word out, uh, abounding, it's a word that means outstanding or the word prominent. It's to make, make something well known. It's, it, that's what is seen the most. By the way, the work of the Lord here that he talks about is not merely anything that we attach the name of Jesus to. Kind of like, you know, a work truck, you put the little ichthus, the little fish on it. That lets you know he's not just a plumber. <laughs> he's a Jesus plumber, right? It, and, and that may be true. But that's not what Paul's talking about here. The work of the Lord is not just anything that we just add the name of Jesus to. The work of the Lord is not our favorite pet cause with a little bit of Jesus sprinkled in. Like a, you know, maybe for example, a political party platform. In the context of chapter 15, it is unmistakable, it is the unmistakable work of the gospel being made known. It's the gospel. This, Paul says, is to be what's most prominent about you and your church. This is what is to be outstanding. This is the abounding work that is done in the Lord. And then you have a, a wonderful promise here at the end. Know this, knowing this, always being reminded of this, that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Notice the careful caveats that Paul gives here. There's a lot that I've done, probably you've done as well, if you're, if you're honest, that has been vain work. There's a lot of misspent youth and time and situations and conversations. But what's done in the name of the Lord is not in vain. Your work right now in the abnormal is not in vain. This final statement provides the reason for, for all the exhortations that Paul has given because you know this. All that is done truly in the name of the Lord, all the labors of life will not be burned up. It will not be in vain. We are to give ourselves gladly and fully to the Lord's work. Since nothing, listen to this, brothers and sisters, nothing you do in this life is futile if done for Christ. Nothing. That's working hard and being a light in a, maybe a difficult job situation. That's changing diapers, raising children, raising husbands. <laughs> Notice something that goes on here, and he kind of ends something. There's a bracket 
that goes at, at the beginning of chapter 15 and it's here at the end in verse 58. Vanity is what brackets this chapter. I want you to notice this. Look back at verse 2. Remember he said, unless you believed in vain. There is a, a type of faith that is a false faith. It is a shallow faith. It's a rocky soil faith. Paul says back in verse 2, it's a vain faith. It's, it's vanity. It's meaningless. Solomon would say in Ecclesiastes, it's a bell. It's, it's, it's a vapor. It's nothing. If your faith is genuine, then it's not in vain, and your work will be, your work in the gospel will not be in vain. So, so Paul ties all this together here. If you believed in vain, your, your faith, your work will be in vain. Here at the end, if you're a follower of Christ, your work in the Lord is not in vain. Paul has a similar idea in Galatians 6, 9. Let us not lose heart, church, in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. Paul says, I endure all things for the sake of the elect. That is the work. So Paul is saying here that how we understand our future resurrection should have an immediate impact on how we live today. When our hearts are easily discouraged, Paul says we cling to the hope of our resurrection. Whatever we encounter in this life is but a momentary and light affliction. Do you understand that? What we believe about the future affects what we do now. Now, I need to give a, a very important caveat to all of this that's been said here. And especially if, if you're not sure where you stand with the Lord. This is important. Believing in the resurrection, the historical resurrection, will not save you. Believing that there are rational, historical, even scientific proofs for a right resurrection will not save you. Did you know you can believe those things and be lost? There's an interesting example of this, a sad example. I was reading a book about Benjamin Franklin this last year. It's called The Religious Life of Benjamin Franklin. He was not a Christian. How do we know that? He said, I'm not a Christian. And yet he had some pretty hokey, wild ideas about religious faith and so on. He even wrote his own epitaph that was engraved and is engraved on his tombstone in the cemetery of Christ Church in Philadelphia. And here's what it says. He wrote this himself. The body of Franklin, printer. Like the cover of an old book, its contents torn out and stripped of its lettering and gilding, lies here food for worms. But the work will not be lost, for it will appear once more in a new and more elegant edition, revised and corrected by the author, capital A. What's truly shocking about that is that he believed in a resurrection, but he didn't believe in Christ. You can believe in all the evidences that demand a verdict. You can believe that the tomb was empty and it's historical in nature and that there really was a Jesus. And by the way, all of that's true. But what makes it true is not historical evidence. What makes it true is Jesus himself who was resurrected from the grave. Do you know this Jesus? If you do, church, this changes everything and this is how we live in the abnormal. That's what Paul says here. If you don't, your only hope is Christ. Not a moral life, not a historical investigation of this or that. Your only hope is to believe by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You already believe all manner of things by faith. Everyone does. God calls us to believe in his son Jesus by faith, to put our full trust and hope in him alone. He will secure you, he will save you, he will forgive you. He will cover your sins. He will remove them as far as the east is from the west. And you will have hope and life in him. And this changes everything, even in this life, in the abnormal. Would you pray with me? Now, our Lord, we fall down before your majesty on high. And we pray that you would make us conscious of our sins until we tremble before you in true repentance. May we be increasingly set free from sin's grip and live in light of the truths we have heard today. Until you take us away from this earthly pilgrimage and remove all the corruption and all else that truly hinders us from enjoying your goodness and grace, help us to always cleave to you through the refreshing mercies of Jesus our Lord. And we all say, 
Amen. This is a special and sweet time for us. We want to finish our service by taking communion together. If you would like to do that with us as you came in, there's some communion cups offered. If you did not receive these if you would, and want one, if you would just slip up your hand and our guys will get those to you. If you need one of these, just slip up your hand and they'll come around to you. It's important that you understand that communion is not, kind of like verse 58, it is not a salvation ordinance. It's a sanctifying ordinance. It is, a, it is an ongoing demonstration of the life and the love of the church for one another, for Christ. Taking this will not save us. It's only Christ that saves us. Taking the bread and the cup does not save, but it demonstrates it shows, it exalts, it expresses, it expounds, and it makes much of Christ. And it's a tangible reminder for us as we gather together once a week as the body of Christ. And what a special day it is for us to come together and celebrate this together. If you're not sure where you stand with the Lord, would you just not take it this morning? No one sits in judgment on you. But if you would like to know more about what it means to be a follower of Christ, if you've got questions about the faith, you know, some of us will be available to you after the service, and we'd love to talk with you and pray with you. But this is, Paul says earlier in 1 Corinthians 11, this is for the body of Christ. When you gather together as the body of Christ, and this is an outward expression of an inward reality. You're saying by taking this bread and drinking this cup, I belong to Christ. And I belong to Christ because he has bought me. He has paid for me. He has saved me from my sins. He has rescued me from my futile way of life. And he has redeemed me. And he has poured out his grace and his mercy upon me. That is the testimony of this cup and this bread. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, that I received from the Lord, which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus is the bread of life. As you put that little piece of bread in your mouth, it is a small, very temporary, very tasteless <laughs> reminder that we have an eternal Savior who is coming for us. His body was laid down in place of yours, his life for yours. Next, Paul says, in the same way, he took the cup after supper, and Jesus said this, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take it together. As we live in the abnormal, what are we doing? As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, what are we doing? You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's what we want to do now. As before we come for our benediction, we want to proclaim the Lord's life and death and resurrection on our behalf. We're going to sing together. Let's stand together and then we'll have our benediction. Christ the 
Christ the Lord upon the tree in the stead of ruined sinners hangs the lamb of victory see the price of our redemption see the father's plan unfold bringing announcements just before we dismiss with the benediction one an email was sent out yesterday regarding some changes coming with our COVID-19 practices that will begin April 25th if you did not receive that email you can check on the website or talk to one of us in short starting the 25th we will no longer strongly recommend wearing masks if you want to wear a mask you still can we will not be spacing the chairs so we will have more chairs in this room the sanctuary the mask only room will still remain the same. It will be space and it will still require masks. Um, and we're also going back to one service. That's, that's starting April 25th. What service? Next week. Oh, okay, thank you. It sounds like I need to review the email again. Sorry about that. <laughs> or the website. The second is, second announcement, Young Adult Fellowship, April 10th. There will be various games. There will also be a bonfire. There will be food. If you would like to go to that, participate to that, if you're a young adult, please contact Skylar Reed or if you have any questions. The third one is annual budget meeting. That is Thursday, April 22nd. Mark your calendar for that. That's going to be via Zoom. Details will be coming shortly. Now for the benediction or blessing comes from 1 Thessalonians 3, 12 and 13. It says this, and may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people so that he may establish your hearts without blame and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. You're dismissed.